do we go after him? In this weather? And with this mess on the road, not lightly anyway, he won't get far when the call goes out for him. The policeman grinned and said jokingly, Wanted. Little chief sitting bull, five foot six inches, fair haired, blue eyed, age fifteen plus, wearing a red, green and yellow blanket, or wet blue jeans, grey t shirt and brown jacket. Approach with caution. This man is dangerous. He paused. Thought for a moment and added, I forgot. Addition to description. Wanted person's face is heavily freckled. Funny thing, said the other. You don't often see boys with such freckled faces these days, do you? They seem to have gone out of fashion or something. As the two policemen went back to the road block to try and clear it, Smiler reached the cover of the woods at the top of the hill. He crashed into the undergrowth like a rocket and put up a couple of pheasants that flew away, honking and screeching with alarm. The noise so startled Smiler that he slipped and fell flat on his face. Because of the effort of his clumsy running and the loss of the little wind he had left from the fall, he lay there panting like a stranded fish. <coughs> For a few moments, while he rested, getting his breath back, Smiler gave himself a talking to. He was a great one for talking to himself in moments of crisis. He lectured to himself now, face close to the wet, leaf-littered ground. Samuel M., he said. Smiler was other people's name for him, and he didn't care much for it. It was a silly kind of punning joke on his name. He preferred Samuel M., because that was what his father called him. You got a Think this out. You're wet and muddy and half naked. Your clothes is all soaked and your belly's rumbling a bit now and then because all you've had in about the last two days is them eggs, just raw and nothing to write home about. You are wanted by the police, like a real criminal, which you aren't. It was never you that took the old lady's handbag. Thing number one, then. Them cops down there won't follow you. Not in this weather. With that accident to look after. Good. Thing number two, you've got to get warmed up and fed. And into hiding. You've got to look for a safe, sheltered anchorage where you can get everything stowed, ship shape, and work out a new course. And thing number three is, you'd better get them wet clothes on. Just wearing a coloured blanket is going to make you stand out like a Catherine wheel against a tarred fence. So Smiler got to his feet, stark naked under the leaden rain deluging sky. He began to pull on his wet blue jeans as he struggled with them, hissing with the effort through his teeth. At their awkwardness, there was a massive bellow of thunder from away to the west, and the whole sky was lit with another blaze of lightning, slashing earthwards. This time, though, Smiler could not uh, know it. The lightning was doing exactly the same for another prisoner as the previous bolt from the blue had done for him. Ten miles away, northwest of the wood in which Smiler was dressing, and about four miles, a little southwest of the Wiltshire town of Warminster, was the large country estate, an ancestral home of the Marquis of Bath. The mansion was called Longleat House, and the estate around it, Longleat Park. Part of the park had been turned into a wild animal reserve. Every day of the year, cars rolled into Longleat Park, bringing tourists to see the treasures of the beautiful Longleat House and also to see the lions of Longleat and the other animals which were kept in huge, penned-in stretches of the parkland. 
Every day cars moved around the road, which twisted and twined through the high fenced animal enclosures. <coughs> the road ran first through the East African section, which held giraffes, zebras, ostriches and antelopes, and then on through the monkey jungle with its baboons that often caged uh, the often caged free riders on top of the the cars and so into the lion reserve where the kings of beasts sometimes lay lazily across the roadway refusing to move out of the path of the cars until the mood took them finally the car processed and entered the cheetah area Today, because it was February and the storm and the rain-filled days, <coughs> there were no more than three or four cars in the whole animal's reserve. At this moment, there was none in the cheetah section. In fact, there were few animals out in their enclosures either. They no more liked the rain and the storm than human beings. The baboons were in their dugouts and the lions in their wooden pens and stretched out on the sheltered verandas of their huts. In the cheetah reserve, all the cheetahs were under shelter in their huts, all except one. This cheetah was a female. Her name was Yara. All the cheetahs in the enclosure had names. Apollo Chester, Lotus, Suki, Tina, and Schultz. Yara was a full-grown female. She weighed 130 pounds. She stood nearly three feet high to her narrow, raking shoulders, and from the point of her black nose to the tip of her long, tufted tail, she measured seven foot and one inch. Yara was a good-tempered animal. She had been captured as a cub in Africa, brought to Germany from there and from there to Longleat Park. She was a magnificent animal. Under the rain, the spots on her tawny orange coat were as black as small wet coals. The dark lines on her face, maskings running from inside the eyes down around her muzzle, were boldly drawn charcoal lines. Her throat an underbelly were creamy white and her eyes tawny gold. As she moved, she swung her long tail from side to side, flicking little sprays of rain from the tuft at its end. When the cheetah warden came into the enclosure in his Land Rover and Yara felt in the mood she could jump in one easy, long-flowing movement to the top of the driving cab. Sometimes, to give the cheetahs exercise, the warden towed a trail rope from the back of the Land Rover with a piece of meat tied to it for the cheetahs to chase. Even though he accelerated at 40 miles an hour, Yara could easily keep up. If he had gone at 60 miles an hour, she could could have held pace with the car for a while. Today, Yara was strangely restless. The rain and the thunder and lightning had increased her restlessness. It was not the restlessness that overcame her and the other cheetahs when, from time to time, they marked with their keen sight the movement of guinea fowl, partridge, pheasants and young deer moving on the free slopes of the parkland outside the enclosure. At those times, they raced to the wire fence looking for the freedom of the hunt and the chase, only to turn back and stalk the length of the wire, stubby ears alert, the desire for complete liberty moving hot and strong through their powerful bodies. Now, something else had made Yara restless and she did not know what it was. All she knew was that where normally she would have taken shelter from the rain, 
She now wanted to remain outside, moving up and down and along the line of the boundary fence. Up and down, up and down she stalked. The fence was strong and made of two inch iron mesh. It was over 12 feet high with an inward overhang at the top and it was supported on strong wooden poles with here and there a large concrete support to give added strength. Inside the outer fence, a few feet from it, was another fence, about four feet high. Yara and <coughs> any of the other cheetahs could have jumped this inner fence easily, but they never did. What was the point of jumping this fence when it was clear that the outer one was a barrier that could never be overleaped? There was a low rumble of thunder from above and a stronger burst of rain that slashed into Yara's face. She sat down on her haunches close to the inner fence, shook her head and blinked her eyes against the rain scud. She remained there, sitting upright like a sphinx, her eyes on the long grass slope outside the high fence, marking the low flight across it of a bedraggled rook. The slope ran upwards to a patch of ploughed land and then on to a wood that marked its crest. Here and there a fir tree stood out stark, glossy green against the February blackness of the other trees. Another rumble of thunder broke out above, the y above and Yara moved on, her restlessness eating into her. She lowered her forequarters almost to the ground, <coughs> raking with her hind legs at the wet and muddy grass. She sent little clods of earth flying into the air. She turned her head sideways, seeing the cheetah hut at the bottom of the enclosure. Closer was a great fallen oak tree, which the cheetah used as their playground. She opened her jaws, flexed the skin back over her teeth and gums, and gave a long, half-snarling, half-hissing sound that ended in a short, snapping snip. It was at this moment, as Smiler was pulling on his wet jeans over a wet, sh uh, over a wet shirt ten miles away, that the sky above burst with an earth-shaking roar of thunder. A great bolt of lightning was loosed through the low-hanging clouds, setting the grey day ablaze with vivid light. The lightning hit the outer fence of the cheetah enclosure ten yards below Yara. It ran in an exploding aura of blue fire, the length of the wire mesh. It found the metal bolts in a concrete support and ripped fence and support from the ground as though a great hand had smashed and flung them down. The falling top half of the support flattened the low inner fence a yard from Yara. She leapt, snarling with fright into the air. Her nostrils were charred with the smell of burning from the lightning strike. She came down from her panic bound on top of the collapsed outer section of the boundary fence. As thunder rolled angrily again, she was gone. Her whole body, every nerve in her, impelled by fear and shock. She streaked away up the grassy slope towards the wood in a wild, fast-leaping run, moving like a tawny gold streak at top speed. Within 30 seconds of leaving the cheetah enclosure, closure she was in the wood on the hill crest. The first burst of fierce speed deadened her. She found a small patch and moved along it, trotting now. Fear and panic were easing from her. 
with her fright and shock gone, she now found the strange restlessness she had known all day still with her. She gave herself over to it in a way she could never have done in the enclosure because she was at liberty. She was less than twenty. It was less than twenty minutes before the cheetah warden in his Land Rover discovered that Yara was gone. Over his walkie-talkie set, he sent out a message to his headquarters, and arrangements were immediately put in hand to organise a search party. By then, Yara was well away, beyond the wood, moving slowly down the lee of a small orchard of bare apple trees. The land dropped steeply below her. A mile away she could see the line of a road with cars speeding along it. Yara stopped. She watched the road for a while and then turned and began to work a line across country parallel to the road below.